How is everyone today? Good. <laughs> Super positive. <laughs> <laughs> so, last time we were talking about uh, function inversion. And uh, there's one aspect of it that we haven't done yet. Uh, so, to, to, to point that aspect out, I'll ask, um, does 5 have an additive inverse? Yes. And how do you know it does? Because <laughs> all of them do, right? All numbers have an additive inverse. Do I have the lights like reversed? Maybe. Uh, so, 5 does have an additive inverse. What is its additive inverse? Negative 5. And why is it that negative 5 is the additive inverse of 5? Because when you add them together, you get the additive identity. identity. And then what is the multiplicative inverse of 5? <laughs> Multiplicative inverse uh, of five. One-fifth. One fifth. Why is it that one-fifth is the inverse of, is the multiplicative inverse of five? Because when you multiply them, you get the multiplicative identity. Okay. So, uh, the formula for additive inverse is negation, and the formula for multiplicative inverse is reciprocal. And every number has a reciprocal except zero. Uh, well, what we haven't done is, is, is we, we did talk about the, the compositional identity. And what's the name of the compositional identity? ID. Uh, but we haven't, and we have not talked about how to compute the inverse of a function. OK, so let's do that. So. Uh, for example, no, first I need to make a remark. Uh, if function f is invertible, then its inverse, its inverse is denoted f with superscript negative 1. OK. So now example, how about the function f of x is 3x minus 2. Now, would you please provide a sketch, just a sketch, of what this should look like. So how should it look? So will this be a parabola? Will it be a smiley face? What will it be? A line. A line, and uh, what what specific things can you tell me about this line? At negative two, so it'll be down here. At negative two, and then what? Slope of three. Slope of three, so it slopes up pretty quick. Something like this. Okay. So I. So, so that's the sketch. Second question. My question is, does f inverse exist? So it's a question. How do you, how do you confirm or deny the existence of f inverse? So. 
I, I didn't mention it because I was hoping you would remember it. How do you tell if a, if a function is invertible? Horizontal line test, right? Uh, because remember, we know another I word for functions that's not, in, that's not invertible. What is it? Starts with that one. Injective. So uh, the, this question, does f inverse exist, is equivalent to asking, is, is f injective, which is equivalent to asking, does this pass the horizontal line test? Yes. And so it does. So that question is equivalent to asking horizontal line test, and the answer is yes. OK. In that case, uh, in that case, let's compute f inverse. OK. <clears throat> So I'll start up here because it takes a little bit of work. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll start out by writing that, that function, f of x is 3x minus 2. So this is me showing you how to do it by example. You'll do the next one. So all, all that I did is I wrote the function and then I replaced f of x with y because we're we're construing the, uh, the input to be x and the output to be y. But if we were to run this function in reverse, then which, which would, then the inputs and outputs would, would change roles. Now the x's would be outputs and the y's would be inputs. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for x. Let's solve for x. Uh, and if we wanted to solve for x, what would we need to do? Add two. Then what? Divide by three. <laughs> okay, good. It's Monday. Mm -hmm. It's X. And now we're going to do one thing that's a little bit weird. We're going to do one step, one last step, and what we're going to do is we're, because we're so accustomed to, uh, now that we have solved for x, which was the goal, uh, now that we have done that, we're going to swap x's and y's. So everywhere we see uh, y, write x. Everywhere you see x, write y. So x plus 2 over 3 is y. And therefore, the answer is that the inverse function evaluated at x is that expression, x plus 2 over 3. OK. <clears throat> so we basically had to do uh, two things. So this much of it. This much of it was solve for x. The reason why we're doing that is because we're, we're trying to, we want to express the input uh, to f in terms of its output. No apostrophe. Okay, because this, we're trying to run the machine in reverse, yes? Why can't you just switch x and y to the beginning? You can. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, how, well, on this example, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you, if you can get into a little bit of trouble if you're not paying close attention on a more complicated example that we'll do in a minute. So what we did right here, this step, uh, this step right here, we swapped x's and y's. And I'd like for you to understand the geometry uh, of, of this step, what it's saying. 
So you may remember from Friday, we drew an example that looked like this. We said, okay. So in the first place I asked, is that a function? And we all said, yes. Then I asked, is it an invertible function? And we all said, yes. And then I said, well, if this point right here happens to be five zero, that is to say, when you plug in five, input five, the output is zero, if that's the case, then what is one of the points on the inverse function? So what we're saying with the red function, cons con considering it to be a box, if you put a five in on the left side, then what comes out on the right? Zero. So if you push the zero back in, then what pops out on the left? Five. The five. So if five zero is on the original, then what's on, then what's on the inverse function? Zero five. And so generally speaking, if if five uh, if if point A B is part of the original, then point B A is part of the inverse. You just transpose the coordinates. Three two becomes two three. Uh, five four becomes four five. Three three becomes three three. Right? So this is the same. geometrically as reflecting across y is x. So if you were to take this red and consider the red to be looking in the blue mirror, what would it see on the other side? You would see something like this. <coughs> so that's what this last, last step uh, you, can, you can think of what, what it represents. It represents the reflection. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's verify that we actually did it. Let's verify that we did it correctly. <clears throat> so for example, uh, what, what, what do we need to do to verify that this really is the, this function that we're calling f inverse actually is the inverse of f. How do we verify that? For example, if I were to say, please verify that two-thirds and three-halves are multiplicative inverses, then what would you do? Multiply them and check that you get the multiplicative identity, right? So I'm asking you to verify that these functions are inverses. So what do you need to do? So let me be more specific. I want you to verify that they're compositional inverses. Compose them. Okay, good. So how about f composed with f inverse evaluated at x? We'll do it in that order first. So to write that without uh, the composition operator, that would be f of f inverse of x. And then I'll cover that up so it doesn't lead me astray and look at what f does. F, f takes its argument and does three argument minus two. So whatever it is that I'm covering, it should be three that minus two. So three that minus 2, and then now I can substitute in what f inverse is. So that'd be 3 x plus 2 over 3 and then minus 2. So notice that the 3's cancel. The 2's cancel. So we're left with x. But what's another name for x? Just x by itself. That would be id of x. So this function, what it does to x, this f composed with, with <coughs> f composed with f inverse, is the same thing that id of x does. So that's good. For the other order, 
f inverse composed with f, evaluate at x. Well, that would be f inverse evaluated at f of x. And now I'll, I'll obscure the input so it doesn't lead me astray. And look what f inverse does. It takes its argument, x, takes its input, x, and produces input plus 2 over 3. So that would be input plus 2 and then over 3. <coughs> So now I'll substitute in what f does, which is up there. <coughs> 3x minus 2, and then add 2, and then divide by 3. Well, the 2's cancel. Let's see. Need a little more vertical space. Uh, the twos cancel, and then the threes cancel, and we're left with ID. Uh, we're left with x, which is ID of x. Okay. So, any question about this example? Why do you have to check it both ways? Right. And the general. So what? So what? What she said was sometimes it works the one way but not the other, and that, that's true. We've, we've, we've seen that. And the reason why is because composition doesn't commute. Okay. Addition commutes, multiplication commutes, composition does not commute. Any question about this example? <coughs> yes? Uh-huh. Uh, almost, not exactly. Uh, the reason why, you said one-third x plus two? Uh, not exactly, because it would be one-third x and then plus two-thirds. So it wouldn't be exactly right. Uh, the, the, reason, the reason why it would, th that wouldn't be exactly right is that what are the coordinates of this point right here? Zero, negative two, and then as a result of that, you know another point which is which is on the inverse one. What's on the inverse one? Two. Negative two, zero. So that would be right here. Uh, negative two, zero. <coughs> so your intuition about it having slope one third is right. That's right. But your intuition about it having uh, intercept uh, 2 is not going to be right because <coughs> it's going to slope shallowly. Like that. And that's going to end up being uh, 2 thirds height. Okay, notice that they cross right there. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So how about uh, first question in this example? Is f of x equal to 3x squared plus 1 uh, invertible? What do you think? No, it's not. Why is it not? Because after all, this, this thing has the shape of a parabola. So you can see that, well, for one reason, it's a quadratic. Okay, for, for a further reason, you could write 
y is 3x squared plus 1. And then I could say, put this in standard form, in the, in the standard form where you could tell what the 1 and what the 3 are doing to the input and output variables so that you can see the transformation that's occurring. So, so this 1, is it playing with x's or y's? That's, that is to say, is it playing with inputs or outputs? It's playing with the y's. It's playing with the y's. It, it's over here with the x's, but it actually has something to do with the y's. Uh, and it belongs over here. y minus 1 is 3x squared. The reason why you can see that, more or less, is that you, you put parentheses uh, around whatever the main function is. And the, the main function is the squaring bit. And who's in there with x? Was that 1 in there with x? It wasn't, right? So it can be moved over to be with the y. How about the 3? Is that? Is that 3 affecting the x's or the y's? It's, a, it's equivalent to asking, is that 3 inside of those parentheses with the x? They didn't, right? So we need to move it over to be with the y's. So all of the action here had to do with the y's. None, none of the action had to do with the x's. So what this is saying is that because, because we're dividing by 3, that's, uh, that's making the, the vertical part of the coordinate system shorter by a factor of 3. So then the objects are what? The plot is what? Taller. In the same sense that, you know, if you, if you were 5 feet right now and we conspired and, and changed all of the rulers in the universe, to be one third as tall as they are, then after that, that uh, after that conspiracy was concluded, you'd be 15 feet tall, because you'd be able to stack 15 of those rulers where you could you could formerly just do five. Okay. Uh, and then the the y minus one causes the plot to shift up. Okay. So that means that this thing that we just we're considering looks like this. So it's like a slightly shifted up and, and stretched vertically parabola. So the, so the answer is, is, was no. And why, why is the answer obviously no from this picture? Fails the horizontal line test. OK. is the function h of x equal to 3x squared plus 1. So, so far, it's exactly the same as the one I wrote up there. Uh, is, is this function uh, on the interval 0 to infinity? So that's its domain. Is that invertible? What do you think? No, this function. So this function. Which one's it going to be? So what was the domain of this function up here, this f? OK, I agree. What is the natural domain of f? All reals. So the domain of this function was all reals. Because remember that the rule is that if the domain is not explicitly specified, then the domain is the natural domain of the expression defining it. So then what's the domain of, of h? 0 to infinity. So is h invertible? Yes. It is. Why is it? Because we're cutting it in half, right? It's saying uh, what I'm what I'm saying with with, al with algebra is I'm saying well I agree that this red picture does not represent an invertible function, but what if we just take the right half 
Is the right half when taken by itself an invertible function? And the answer is yes, it is. Okay, well in that case, let's compute the inverse. Okay, well the first step starts with changing that h of x to a y. So y is 3x squared plus 1. <coughs> Okay, then what are we going to do? Okay, so the, I agreed that that's the first thing that we're going to do, but what's the overall thing we're doing currently? We want to we solve for x. So what we're trying to do is that for h, the output is y, but for h inverse, the output is x. So what we want to do is, is solve for the, for the other variable. So we would get y minus 1 is 3x squared, and then divide by 3, y minus 1 over 3 is x squared. And now we're trying to solve for x. So now what? Square root of both sides. So y minus 1 over 3 is the square root of x squared. So square root of y minus 1 over 3. And what is the square root of x squared? Not x. It's the absolute value of x. But we do desperately need it to be x. We need it to be x, because otherwise we can't answer the question. Uh, so now, y minus 1 over 3. In, in absolute value, or, or in radical, I mean, is just, is just x. Now, why is it? Why can we do this? What, what must be true about x? It's in there, right? Because x is in there, that's why we can do this. The only time uh, we'd need to do negate x to compute its absolute value is if, if it was less than 0, but we're saying that that's not the case. So, so we were able to do it, and now what's the last step? The swap step. So now, you had, you had asked about 15 minutes ago you'd said, well, what if we just start out by swapping? If, <clears throat> if you had swapped first and you got to that line that's right above my fingers there, <clears throat> fingers there, it would read absolute value of y because you'd be computing the square root of y squared and it wouldn't be clear whether or not you'd be able to drop the absolute value. But holding off the swap until the last makes it to where it's clear. Okay, so as a result, what is the inverse function? Well, it's that. Okay, so that was part three, so how about part four? Can you give it a sketch over there? What should it look like? And again, it's just a sketch.
Okay, well, it should, it should be symmetric across the line y is x. So, should be able to look like that. So any point that's on the axis is kind of easy to do, right? Because if it's on that axis right there, that means that when you reflect it, it's got to reflect to the other axis. So something like that. And then if it, if it bends toward the axis and then away, this one should also bend toward the axis and then away. Okay, and this is not an art class. You're not graded on, on your artistry. But the bendiness has to be right. Okay, so that is to say the red one bends toward uh, the symmetry uh, axis and then away, so the green one couldn't possibly be bent like this also. That, would, that just couldn't be right. Good. Any question about this example? <clears throat> Any question about it? Okay. So now we're in a new chapter. Chapter 4. Um, so we're in section 4.1, and it's called uh, linear functions. Okay. So every linear function uh, can be expressed f of x is mx plus b. So this doesn't really <coughs> come as uh, new information. So now I'm going to make a 3 by 3 table here. Three rows, three columns. tic-tac-toe? No. <laughs> That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Okay, so here I'm going to put, this is the row with b is negative, this is the row with b is zero, this is the row with b is positive. And this is the row with m is negative, this is the row, or sorry, column with m is negative, column with m is zero, and column when m is positive. Okay, so what we're going to do is draw uh, a picture for all of those combinations. So I need to draw an axis in each one. So now, in the formula mx plus b, uh, what does the m represent? Slope. Right. So uh, we're singling out the possibilities of negative slope, uh, zero slope, and positive slope. Okay. So what does negative slope mean? It means that as you go right, what happens? 
you go down. So what I want you to observe is, is what that really means, or at least what that means to, to, to a mathematician, is that, is that for the input axis, if you travel in the sense, in the same sense as the input axis, so notice that the input axis is pointed to the right. If you travel in the same sense as the, uh, on the input axis in the same sense that it, it has, then you end up traveling in the opposite sense of the output axis. Notice that, notice that the, input, the output is pointing up. So slope down means that when you're traveling the same as the input direction, you travel the opposite in the output direction. So that's what it really means. So down and to the right. Uh, so this one is when you have positive, that means that an, a positive increase in the input results in a positive